This marks the beginning of a new series of comprehensive analysis, interpretation, and summary of Yuval Noah Harari's book, Sapiens, A Brief History of Humankind. This book, another one that I believe should be mandatory reading for every human on the planet. Because it covers something that we are all very ignorant to. How we got here. We have one life. It'll probably take us on average around 80 years to live out. And yet there are thousands, tens of thousands, and millions of years of evolution behind us that most of us have very little understanding of. And so this will cover an extremely important topic surrounding how we got here into this crazy chaotic mess that is the present, the beauty and the chaos. Fire gave us power, gossip helped us cooperate, agriculture made us hungry for more, mythology maintained law and order, money gave us something we can really trust, contradictions created culture, and science made us deadly. This book will cover those main categories and how each one played a very useful role into modulating the human experience and evolving Homo sapiens. We'll begin with part one, the cognitive revolution. Before we begin, all of these will be available not just on YouTube and Facebook, but also all podcast platforms you prefer to listen to and eventually transcribed on medium.com by looking up my name, Alexander Emmanuel Sandalis, and my website, alexanderemmanuel.com. And you can see snippets of these on my Instagram as well. Let's begin. Let's go through a timeline of history. I think we often forget, I say millions of years, I really should have said billions of years because 13.5 billion years ago, matter and energy appeared. Did you realize that? Did you know that? Because that's quite a long time ago. Hard to fathom when the average human lives just a blip in that whole existence before us. Let's fast forward 4.5 billion years, planet Earth is formed. 2.5 million years, we get the evolution of the genus Homo in Africa. 500,000 years ago, Neanderthals evolve. 300,000 years ago, we get the usage of fire daily. 70,000 years ago, the cognitive revolution begins, which will serve as the basis of the chapter we are covering here. This is the beginning of the history of sapiens as we spread out through Africa. 45,000 years ago, sapiens settle in uh, my home country, Australia. As we proliferate throughout the world, we constantly cause an extinction of the associated megafauna. 12,000 years ago, and this is where most of this book really centers around, uh, we get the agricultural revolution. 2,500, invented of coinage. Only 2,500 years ago, only 25 people ago, did we have the invention of coinage and universal money. These, all these things are creations of just the human mind. 2,000 years ago, the Han Empire in China and the Roman Empire is born, as well as Christianity. 500 years ago, the Scientific Revolution. 200 years ago, the Industrial Revolution. And the future? Well, maybe we'll become some intelligent design uh, where Homo sapiens are replaced by superhumans. Maybe. We'll see. Or well, we won't, because we'll be superhumans. Either way. Chapter 1. An animal of no significance. So let's first define uh, what does Homo sapien mean? Because it's the title of the book. Homo sapiens, so first of all, biologists label organisms with a two-part Latin name, a, a genus followed by a species. Homo is the genus, spe uh, sapiens is the species. Lions, for example, are called Panthera leo. The species of leo of the genus Panthera, which is also why the astrology star sign uh, is Leo is a lion. Homo sapiens, the species sapiens means wise. The genus Homo is man. Now, I believe the 
genus sapiens is coming the the definition and the term behind it wise is definitely coming into question uh if you look at the last well years decades uh but that's just a little uh, little poke at the whole species that we are don't worry about that got to be able to laugh at our own uh you know human condition our closest living relatives chimpanzees gorillas and orangutans Chimpanzees are the closest, but just actually six million years ago, single female ape had two daughters. One became the ancestor of all chimpanzees, the other, our grandmother. So, six million years ago, now we're here. However, humans first evolved in East Africa about 2.5 million years ago from an earlier genus of apes called Australopithecus. So, you, some of you may have heard that before. Australopithecus, one of the earliest genus of our ancestors. How old's the our genus, uh, our species, well, we could look at around 2.5 million years so far of what we understand. This book and its evidence may be continually refined, updated, outdated based on new anthropological evidence that is presented as we roam, continue to roam the earth and dig up the dirt. Next, Neanderthals. They're bulkier, more muscular, uh, more well adapted to the colder climate of the Ice Age in Western Eurasia. Then there's the more eastern regions of Asia were populated with Homo erectus. They were known as the upright man who survived uh, there for close to 2 million years, making it the most durable human species ever. Imagine us, Homo sapiens, lasting that long. We will see, or we won't. Homo uh, salensis, uh, because then there's another one, um, more suited for life in the tropics on Indonesian islands. There was also one called uh, Floris. Homo floriensis, which was like this dwarf-like creature. Uh, they were trapped on the island, actually, uh, when the seas rose. So they were poor with resources. So the big people who needed a lot of food died first. And smaller people survived. So it was this interesting natural selection where obviously a small organism with less cells requires, has a, has a lower metabolism and metabolic rate uh, relative to their, to their size, requires less resources. Um, Except ants. Ants are very high relative. Like they have a very high uh, sh power strength ratio versus their size. But um, that's a, that's a different book for now. So I think it's really important to note that there are many different variations of our species. Many different, uh, and and so you know it's not just Homo sapiens, right? We're not the only ones even though we think we're the center of the universe. And it's a common fallacy to envision these species as arranged in a straight line of descent. You know, we think, oh, one came after the other, then the other one came, but no, that doesn't seem to be the case. The linear model gives the mistaken impression that at any particular moment, only one type of human inhabited the earth, and that all earlier species were merely older models of ourselves. But no, we're not like the iPhone. It's not just a new one comes out every year or every million years. The truth is, from about 2 million years ago until around 10,000 years ago, the world was home at one and at the same time to several human species, which is quite remarkable to think about. The Earth of a hundred uh, of a hundred millennia ago was walked by at least six different species of man. Six different species of the sapien that we inhabited. The cost of thinking. Mammals weighing 60 kilograms of an average brain size of 200 cubic centimeters. The earliest men and women 2.5 million years ago had brains of about 600 cubic centimeters, so three times the size. Modern sapiens sport a brain averaging that 1200 to 1400 cubic centimeters, so double again. Neanderthal brains were even bigger. And so this is another reason why, you know, uh, the brain is the most metabolically demanding organ in the body and it is the reason actually why our metabolic rate is the highest out of all of our ape cousins you know chimpanzees orangutans uh, our metabolic rate is the highest which is an interesting observation uh, brain is also the biggest in Homo sapiens, the brain accounts for about 2 to 3% of the total body weight, but it consumes 25% of the body's energy when the body's at rest. By comparison, the brains of other apes require only 8% of rest time energy. I didn't even realize that was coming up. 
based on what I just said, because I'm reading a remarkable book called Burn by Herman Ponza, which talks about the new science of metabolism. So I really recommend that as well. That I will summarize and dissect on my coaching page, Strength of Saad, Saad with two A's on YouTube and Instagram and Facebook, if you want to see that. That's, on, uh, that's more health related. That's why that will go there. Anyway, archaic humans paid for their large brains in two ways. Firstly, they spent more time in search for food. Secondly, their muscles atrophied. Another one is we paid for our more expensive brains in a higher metabolic rate. We needed more resources. Uh, and thus we are more susceptible. Uh, oh, and, and what I really wanted to say is in a higher fat storage. See, why do humans store more fat than all of our ape cousins? Chimpanzees, orangutans are like the fattest of the apes, but like chimpanzees are very lean. Um, we're talking like sub 10%, you know, 5 to 8% body fat. These, these, you shave their bodies, they're, they're ripped. They're very lean animals. We're not. Like the average body fat uh, is... If, I, if we equate both genders, can be anywhere from 15 to 30%. You know, the higher female gender, having a higher body fat distribution for procreation, um, birth reasons, and hormonal reasons, menstrual reasons, menstrual cycle reasons. However, in total, the Homo sapiens species has more fat. Well, it seems like the compensation for our higher metabolic rate to maximize our survival and reproductibility to pr continue our species, well, we needed to, st we adapted to store more fat. We adapted to store more fat. We have more fat reserves uh, in times of starvation and food famine. We can rely on them because we had a high metabolic cost, a high metabolic rate, uh, which is this the sum total of all cellular processes and activities in the body. Ours is much higher or higher than all of our ape cousins. So the, therefore, this is another uh, cost or difference between us and our apes cousins. Um, so like a government diverting money from defense to education, humans diverted energy from biceps to neurons. And, you know, the brain being the most hungry organ in the body, like I said. So what drove forward the evolution of the massive human brain during those two million years? What did it? What was it? Mm, we don't know. We don't know for sure. At least when this book was written. Now there's a bunch of speculation and, you know, fire. Here's one. Stone tools. One of the most common uses of early stone tools was to crack open bones in order to get to the marrow. Some researchers believe this was our original niche, just as woodpeckers specialize in extracting insects from the trees. The first humans uh, specialized in extracting marrow from bones. Why marrow? Well, suppose you observe a pride of lions take down and devour a giraffe. You wait patiently till they're done, but it's still not your turn because the hyenas and the jackals, and you don't want to interfere with them. They scavenge the leftovers. Only then would you and a band uh, dare approach the carcass, look cautiously left and right, and dig into the edible tissue that remained. The marrow is actually quite nutrient dense. This is a key to understanding our history and psychology. Genus Homo's position in the food chain was, until recently, quite subtly in the middle. For millions of years, humans hunted smaller creatures and gathered what they could all the while being hunted by larger predators. It was only 400,000 years ago that several species of man began to hunt large game on a regular basis. And only in the last 100,000 years with the rise of Homo sapiens that man jumped to the top of the food chain. That spectacular leap from the middle to the top had enormous consequences. Other animals at the top of the pyramid, such as lions and sharks, evolved in that position very gradually over millions of years. This enabled the ecosystem to develop checks and balances that prevented lions and sharks from wreaking too much havoc. As lions became deadlier, so gazelles evolved to run faster, hyenas to cooperate better, and rhinoceroses... Ooh, didn't say that right. ...to be more bad-tempered. In contrast, humankind ascended to the top so quickly that the ecosystem was not given time to adjust. So this is interesting, because... Not only did we go through a period of rapid adaptation and change 
quite faster than other animals, but we're going through it now through the advent of modern agriculture and then the industrial revolution, now the technological revolution. How will we, how will our rate of change and adaptation occur now in the next couple of hundred years and thousand years? A race of cooks. By about 300,000 years ago, Homo erectus, Neanderthals, and the forefathers of Homo sapiens were using fire on a daily basis. Whereas chimpanzees spend five hours a day chewing raw food, a single hour suffices for people eating cooked food. The advent of cooking enabled humans to eat more kinds of food, to devote less time to eating, and to make do with smaller teeth and shorter intestines. Some scholars believe there is a direct link between the advent of cooking, the shortening of the human intestinal tract, and the growth of the human brain. Since long intestines and large brains are both massive energy consumers, it's hard to have both. By shortening the intestines and decreasing their energy consumption, cooking inadvertently opened the way to jumbo brains of Neanderthals and sapiens. We don't know exactly where and when animals that can be classified as Homo sapiens first evolved from some earlier type of humans, but most scientists agree that by about 150,000 years ago, East Africa was populated by sapiens that looked just like us. So we're looking at around then, like even 2.5 million years ago, we see the earliest uh, genus, um, if I'm using that term correctly, but about 150,000 years ago, they seem to most represent what we appear like today. When Homo sapiens landed in Arabia, most of Eurasia was already settled by other humans. What happened to them? So there's an interbreeding theory. Archaeologists have discovered the bones of Neanderthals who lived for many years with severe physical handicaps, evidence that they were cared for by their relatives, uh, which is really interesting. Um, because Neanderthals are often depicted in, in character, caricatures as the archetypical brutish and stupid cave people, but recent evidence has changed their image. This is another thing that, another explanation potentially to the transformation, adaptation, and evolution, rapid, rapid evolution of the humans, uh, the Homo sapiens, is our ability to give and share. Herman Ponce talks about it in metabolism as well. When they were studying archaeological digs um, in the early 2000s I believe there was one major dig they found that was quite renowned and reputable I don't know if it was Lucy or not or, or one similar it was like pretty close to a full human skeleton um, and, th and then they just discovered that they found a skeleton uh, who had all these teeth damaged or removed and, and like, how did he eat how did he survive they didn't have you know and it seemed like they made a connection, whether it was from other skeletons they found or the tools in the area, that he, this skeleton, or this person would have survived because someone was giving him food, was helping him, they were sharing. And so there's another potential explanation to the progression, evolution, adaptation, uh, the development of, the, of our human brain, um, is our ability and proclivity to share. Because... We're one of the only species that will share food with each other. If I recall correctly, even chimpanzees are rarely seen to share. Yet we are a very different species in behavior. So there's another theory that describes how we overtook and overrun um, a lot of the previous species that world are the other homogeneuses that were there in across the world another theory is a replacement theory which is basically uh, describes that sapiens replaced all the previous human populations without merging with them um, but simply replacing them uh, whether through brutish force or through basic survival one died off or one killed off don't know but if the replacement theory is correct all living humans have roughly the same genetic baggage, racial dis distinctions uh, among them are negligible. But if the interbreeding theory is right, there might well be genetic differences between Africans, Europeans, Asians that go back hundreds of thousands of years. 
This is political dynamite which could prove material for explosive racial theories. So, we don't know for sure, not at least right now, but um, it's interesting how the social, political, behavioral, psychological implications to, to, to uh, archaeology and ancestry and evolution um, can play a role. It turned out that 1-4% to of the unique human DNA of the modern populations in the Middle East and Europe is Neanderthal DNA. That's not a huge amount, but it's significant. A second shock came several months later when DNA extracted from fossilized finger from uh, Denisovo was mapped. The results proved that up to 6% of the unique human DNA of modern Melanesians and Aboriginal Australians is Denisovan DNA. Whichever theory is true, correct, uh, the Neanderthals and other human species pose one of history's greatest what-ifs. Imagine how things might have turned out had the Neanderthals or Denisovans survived alongside Homo sapiens. What kind of cultures, societies, and political structures would have emerged in a world where seven different human species coexisted? Now this, this is an extremely thought-provoking question. What if they continued on. What if the development of another species, human species, could coexist with us today? Another one develops in the future. You know, I, I, I reference the what I think is an incredible television show, uh, The Expanse, uh, which sets a world hundreds of years in the future, maybe thousands of years in the future, where we have colonized, colonized Mars and we have colonized at the asteroid belts and they pit it's like they discuss and portray three different groups of people as if they're different species well martians right born on mars are you a different species or your 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 environment's very different your gravity uh the what you, you what you have to adapt to, uh, to gravity wise is very different your genes are going to be expressed way differently depending on your environment and your parents who grew up on that same environment then you have people growing up on asteroid belt with very little gravity and having very low bone density very tall thin and lanky individuals and they're also portrayed as and they discuss and they talk about each other as if they're all different even though they all came from you know, similar ancestry when you really go back but it, i think that's the utility of really well-made television shows and movies is that you can really portray and see the story of what could it be if this was or that was. So that's what Yuval poses with this very thought-provoking question as we conclude this chapter. What was Sapien's secret of success? How did we manage to settle so rapidly in so many distinct and ecological different habitats? How did we push all other human species into oblivion? Why couldn't even the strong, brainy, cold-proof Neanderthals survive our onslaught? The debate continues to rage. The most likely answer is the very thing that makes the debate possible. Homo sapiens conquered the world, thanks above all to its unique language. And so that is what alludes to what we'll be talking about in the next chapter, the tree of knowledge throughout the cognitive revolution portion of this book. If you want to stay tuned to staying up to date on all of these videos, uh, podcasts, and book analysis, then you can't just subscribe anymore. YouTube, it, well, you won't probably see the videos unless you hit notifications. Um, that's just the way this, is, uh, this situation is. I rarely even mention it because I have an aversion to even asking people of anything, let alone to hit a button that says subscribe. So do what you want to do. But if you're interested in these videos and you want to see more of them, you can hit, list them on all podcast platforms, on Facebook, Alexander Emanuel Sandalis, on Instagram, Alexander Emanuel. It's all links in the description. Uh, and from there, if you're interested in these books, that's where you can find it all. I've covered The 48 Laws of Power by Robert Greene, How to Win Friends and Influence People by Dale Carnegie, um, Atomic Habits by James Clear, Jordan Peterson, 12 Rules of Life. I'm covering the most impactful, profound books to me. You see all those books behind me? I've read, 
95% of them. However, very few of them are worthy of rereading, rereading and assimilating the principles into my life and doing a deep multi hundred hour analysis on so I can then further ingrain my knowledge and help spread the what I think what I would love my children if I had them or the next generation to learn and understand so we can all be better collectively as people we all rise uh, together the tide rises together as an individual grows better thank you